السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربش رح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل أقدة من لساني يفقه كولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, Welcome back to Muhammad Qasim's channel and today uh, we are discussing about the dreams uh, related to Pakistan uh, and what is the future of Pakistan essentially uh, it is a very important aspect uh, that uh, we need to discuss from Muhammad Qasim's dreams perspective uh, because as we know many of his dreams related to the future uh, actually stage around Pakistan and the development of Pakistan. Uh, Muhammad Qasim has seen that Pakistan develops significantly um, and uh, it grows uh, beyond expectations of the world what, what the world might have. Um, and how exactly that might happen and when that might happen, perhaps we'll be able to answer some clues about this today. Uh, before we begin, uh, in the previous discussion, uh, we have discussed about uh, the dreams related to Imran Khan uh, and how Imran Khan has um, uh, gone through his leadership, uh, the difficulties that he experienced in his leadership, uh, and the end outcome of him being ousted from his leadership. Uh, all of these things uh, that happened to Imran Khan uh, were actually shown to Muhammad Qasim earlier in his uh, dreams from 2017 to 2022. Uh, if you want to look at those dreams in particular, have a look at the previous video. Uh, we are working on getting the subtitles up, so hopefully once they are back up, uh, we will be able to show you a little bit more. Uh, and you will be able to understand uh, a little bit more about the context of this discussion. Um, all right, so uh, I believe my audio is working well. Uh, apologies for the audio being very uh, low in the previous uh, live session. Uh, hopefully this uh, will not be a problem today. Uh, but if you guys cannot hear me, please let me know and uh, inshallah we'll be able to adjust something quickly uh, to help you. Sometimes technology, we hope that it uh, assists us in communicating. Um, it doesn't always work, unfortunately. So, uh, stories about the conception of uh, Pakistan. Uh, we can actually date, date this back to the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Through many hadiths and divine inspirations and indications, uh, we come to learn that the creation of Pakistan or the existence of Pakistan uh, was actually made to serve Islam. Uh, but the situation of Pakistan as we see it today uh, and especially what it has been in the last few decades. Uh, it has not been anywhere near uh, the stature, the stature of uh, being a world leader or leading the Muslim Ummah, as we have uh, heard from Muhammad Qasim's stream. Um, so how is this actually about to happen or how is this going to happen? Uh, it's certainly something that uh, from a perspective of common thought is not easily understood. Uh, but we will be able to look into some uh, indications that are shown in Muhammad Qasim's dreams. Uh, and perhaps we will be able to get some clues about where the events are going towards. Uh, so in today's lectures, uh, what we will first look at are uh, some of the hadiths relating to the existence of Pakistan uh, and, in, and some inspirations that have come about. Uh, we first begin with the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as reported in the Musnad, uh, sorry by uh, Musnad Ahmad. Uh, this hadith says that prophethood shall remain among you as long as Allah wills. Then Khilafat on the matter of prophethood will commence and remain as long as Allah wills. Uh, then a corrupt monarchy will come, or a time of corrupt monarchist will come, uh, and will remain as long as Allah wills. Uh, and then there will be a tyrannical despotism, uh, which will remain as long as Allah wills. 
Um, then after all of these events, once again, Khilafat will emerge on the precept of prophethood. Uh, now, on the commentary of uh, this hadith, uh, a lot of the scholars uh, have come to an agreement or come to a common understanding that the time that we're living in right now is that of the tyrannical despotism, uh, meaning to say that the leaders um, are corrupt, they are uh, causing oppression on the people. Um, even within Muslim uh, countries, we see that many leaders um, are actually out of the way of Islam. They're not implementing uh, the values of Islam or carrying forward the values of Islam. Uh, and there's widespread oppression uh, across the world against Muslims. Um, the coming of Khilafat once again. So uh, it's something that we have to understand what uh, Khilafat actually means. The Khilafat uh, the term Khilafat means successorship. So uh, the Khalifa is a successor to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the first stage after the uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left this world, uh, we know that the Khilafat was originally established by the Khalifa Rashidun, uh, namely Abu Bakr Razi Ta'ala Anhu, Umar Razi Ta'ala Anhu, Usman Razi Ta'ala Anhu, and Ali Razi Ta'ala Anhu. So the return of the Khilafah, the essence of the Khilafat after um, corrupt monarchies and uh, corrupt monarchies and tyrannical uh, oppressive leaders uh, reflects to the coming back of Islam, uh, the coming back or implementation of Islam as it was during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is a very important hadith. Uh, We'll get back to some of the questions. I'm just going to have a quick look whether everyone can hear me properly. Uh, looks like there's no issue here. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, so according to this uh, hadith or the understanding about this hadith, uh, what we see is that the time of the Khilafat will come back and the uh, uh, Islam as it was implemented uh, 1400 years ago uh, during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inshallah that time will also come back uh, and that will be the final stage uh, because uh, there's further commentary about this hadith uh, that uh, after saying these words Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, kept quiet um, and what the uh, scholars have interpreted from that is that this will be the last event to happen before Judgment Day uh, comes in. Um, so uh, a very profound hadith and uh, uh, this, uh, I guess, from a lot of people's perspective, maybe not as well heard, uh, but it certainly is indicates of the times that we are living in. Uh, and where this world is going towards, the, the conclusion that it's heading towards. Uh, but it does raise a question uh, in, our, in our mind that, uh, okay, we have seen the time of the Khilafat, uh, of the Rashiduns, we have seen, gone through the monarchies, uh, the corrupts, uh, the oppressors. So what or where is the Khilafat going to occur from? Uh, where does it come from? Uh, and we get some indications uh, about this from the hadiths uh, of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we'll discuss them uh, just briefly uh, before we go on. Um, one of the first hadiths that uh, we're looking at is uh, in the Darul Qutb al Ilmiya, um, And this hadith goes by the saying, Near your treasure, three people will kill one another. Each of them will be a son of Khalifa, uh, but it will not be to any of them. Then the black flags will come from the east. Now, keep in mind these points that I have highlighted in yellow, and we will come back to these points later on. Then the black flags will come from the east, and they will fight you in a way that no nation had ever fought. Then Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu mentioned something uh, and said, when you see him, pledge allegiance to him, even if you have to crawl on snow. For well, verily, he is the Khalifa of Allah, the Mahdi. 
so there's an indication that black flags will come from the east and there's another indication that this is where the Khalifa will be or indication towards the Khilafah coming from that uh, from that area. Another hadith uh, that has been narrated in Al-Barzanji in Sha'aha Lil Asharat, uh, a nation will come from the east with black flags, once again, east and black flags, and they will ask for some goodness or authority, but the people will not give them. Then they will fight and win over these people. Now the people will give them what they had asked for, but they will not accept it until they will hand it over to a person from my progeny who will fill this earth with justice just as it was previously filled with oppression and tyranny. So if any one of you finds this nation, that is the nation from the east with black flags, then you must join them even if you have to crawl over ice. And then we come across to similar, again, mentions uh, in, in the Hadith. They will emerge from Khorasan, black banners, which nothing will repel until they are set up in Jerusalem. Um, and then there's another Hadith which says, surely black, black flags will appear from the Khorasan until the people will tie their horses with the olive trees between Bayt al and Harasta. Um, now, the indication that we see here is that, uh, or from the Hadith that we uh, come to understand, is that there will be an army that will rise from the east, more likely from where the Khorasan is. And this army will have the Mahdi in it, and this army will liberate Muslims throughout, and it will establish the Khilafah um, on, on earth. So, um, after... Having read through understanding uh, these points, um, we now look at uh, or concern about wh what is actually Khorasan. And uh, Khorasan was an area uh, during the times of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This area was bound uh, much by uh, modern day Afghanistan, Iran, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and some parts of Pakistan. And now the exact geography of what area it actually had uh, is unclear um, because of the fact that this was such a long time ago. Uh, so we don't have full correct references about uh, where Khorasan uh, was or where it existed. Uh, but there are some indications uh, that the researchers have done uh, in, in the analysis and they have presented um, an overview. Uh, so what we what we can generally understand is that Khorasan covered a area which uh, is pretty much modern day Afghanistan, uh, northern or northern eastern parts of Iran, western part of Pakistan, and uh, the countries at the top uh, where we've got Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan. And this was the ancient uh, Khorasan of the times. Uh, of uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But what uh, is also important to understand is that this area, uh, if we don't consider or we we don't look at the Khorasan perspective, uh, this area east of where Prophet Muhammad was at that time and he narrated these hadiths. East of that area includes a uh, broad countries uh, that are Muslim countries at this stage uh, and they are predominantly covering the countries of uh, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan and going towards India. So. Uh, the area concerned with Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and uh, pretty much only is the one that we are looking at from the perspective of the Hadiths. So, east of Mecca and Medina are these countries uh, that exist. Now, one other thing that is uh, also important to note is the uh, account of 
George Thomas Napier. George Thomas Napier was a British army officer. Uh, this is at the time of the Peninsular War, um, and he uh, commanded the army of Cape Colony. Uh, he was the one who described Khorasan uh, as uh, containing or, or covering the areas of Afghanistan, Iran, and the western parts of Pakistan. Now, the context of these hadiths have been discussed uh, in great detail by uh, the scholars of present and past. Um, some of the scholars that are very prominently known to have talked about these hadiths, uh, especially from Pakistan, uh, is Dr. Israr Ahmed. Um, not many people, I guess, know about him uh, from a Western world perspective, uh, but in the subcontinent, he was a very well-known, renowned scholar of Islam, and uh, he had written many books about Pakistan and the importance of Pakistan and the future of Pakistan. And he had a lot of passion about what uh, he understood about Pakistan and the future of Pakistan. Uh, similarly, we have other scholars, uh, of whom a prominent scholar is Sheikh Imran Hussain. Uh, he has also talked about Pakistan, uh, predominantly in his uh, research on Islamic eschatology. Now, Islamic eschatology covers uh, an aspect of uh, future or predicting or uh, concluding what events will happen until the end of Qayyama. Um, and uh, in this Islamic eschatology, uh, Pakistan seems to have an important role to play in the future, uh, an important place in the future, as you, as you could see. Now, I've mentioned only a couple of uh, scholars here, but uh, there are a wide uh, number of scholars. Uh, perhaps some are not as popular as others. Um, and they come to a similar conclusion about Pakistan. Um, a lot of these scholars are uh, mostly based in the eastern subcontinental area uh, or Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, as opposed to the West. Um, but their understanding or the conclusions, the talks that they have made, uh, what we can make, a uh, conclusion that we can make from what they have said uh, is that Pakistan or things about Pakistan is that Pakistan was made for Islam. Uh, it was made uh, on the name La ilaha illallah. Pakistan over its time has failed uh, to implement Islamic values uh, within its uh, country and its social structures. Uh, Pakistan will have a critical role to play in the future for Islam. And uh, possibly, possibly the starting point of the Khilafat uh, is likely be from Pakistan. Now, these are the conclusions that I have made after having listened to a lot of these lectures from the uh, scholars that I've mentioned uh, and other scholars who talk about Pakistan and the importance of Pakistan um, based on the analysis of Ahadith uh, that are related to the end times. Uh, in addition to this, uh, now that we have discussed the prophetic uh, hadiths, nature, and the Islamic scholars, um, Sufi or spiritual Sufi traditions, um, there's there's a very strong hold uh, of the Sufi practices and Sufi traditions within Pakistan, and uh, there have been many walis, uh, walis termed as the friends of Allah that come from the subcontinental region uh, and many of these spiritual Sufi uh, traditions uh, or saints of the present past, they have made astounding claims about Pakistan. Uh, now, what they claim to be or what they claim to say are based on their personal inspirations, um, their personal experiences. Uh, they may include some aspect of uh, learning or uh, extracting from the hadiths or from the Islamic eschatology, uh, but predominantly this is based on their personal inspirations. And one of the prominent uh, figures in Pakistan uh, who I have quoted here, his name is Baba Yahya Khan. 
he says Pakistan was not born to die. It is made by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anha. He further says that it is a gift from Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anha, and nothing will happen to Pakistan. He asserted that the Pakistan will lead the whole Muslim world in the future. Uh, a point to note for us uh, while we're having this discussion. Uh, about what the Sufis has said. Uh, there is also another prominent uh, Sufi saint from uh, the uh, subcontinental world. He goes by the name of Naimatullah Shah Wali. Uh, he had made many predictions spanning 800 years and a lot of his predictions came true exactly as what he had described in his writings. Um, in his writings, uh, the picture that he's given is of the past more so than the present uh, world or present time that we live in um, and the past about the uh, time of the sultans the wars that happened between pakistan and india um, those things have been discussed uh, by him and in one of his um, predictions uh, it is said that the war between india and pakistan will happen or start between Eid al adha and Eid al fitr and pakistan would get back all the areas which India annexed from it. Uh, so perhaps there will be a situation where India will annex areas from Pakistan. Uh, and then the, he goes on to say that there will be a lot of blood loss uh, or a lot of people will die in this war. And uh, then there will be other countries surrounding Pakistan like Afghanistan, Iran and Turkey that would actually help Pakistan uh, in this war. So that was the prediction from Naimatullah Shah Wali. Um, now, one important uh, and prominent figure that we cannot forget uh, in this discussion uh, at the moment uh, is that of the personal experience of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Uh, now, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, he is the founder of Pakistan. Uh, a little bit about his history. He uh, grew up in the subcontinent, uh, but then he went to uh, the UK or England where he studied and became a lawyer. And he spent much of his um, uh, adult life there, as in the young youth adult life there, um, before coming to Pakistan. Now, while he was a lawyer, uh, he was very much in touch with the people um, in the subcontinent, particularly the Muslim leaders at, of that time uh, who were going through the uh, time of the British uh, perhaps leaving from the subcontinent and there were discussions about what would happen, who would rule, uh, who would be the leaders at that time. But anyway, this uh, divine inspiration that Muhammad Ali Jinnah experienced uh, was just before that time of um, the partition of the subcontinent happening and uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, explains that uh, one evening he was strolling in the lawn and he felt something unique uh, and that same day he uh, went to sleep and he had a uh, significant dream in that dream he saw Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered him to go to India and lead the Muslims to their destiny. Um, now, what happened after uh, this was obviously uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah coming to Pakistan, uh, to the subcontinent and taking a leadership role in the discussions uh, for having a separate land and separate area for the Muslims. Um, and from there on, uh, the uh, actual struggle and the partition began where Pakistan was formed in 1947. Uh, so once again, a very significant um, dream of Muhammad Ali Jinnah or a divine inspiration that we can say about the existence or formation of Pakistan. Now, while we are here, it is also important for us to understand uh, some of the hadiths that relate to seeing Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in dreams. Um, now, the hadith that we've got here, there's multiple narrations. I've got some references if you want to go and read them in further detail. 
the hadiths basically describe that seeing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a dream is truly seeing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because shaitan cannot appear in in someone's dream uh, by the image of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, and also, good dreams of a faithful believer is part of uh, prophetism, 46th part of prophetism. And when it comes to the time closer to the end times, nothing uh, will remain except for al-Mubashirat. And al-Mubashirat, uh, Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, were the true good dreams or the dreams that convey good tidings to the people. So um, these are important things or important hadith points that we have to understand when we look at the con concept of uh, dreams and we're discussing the aspect of dreams. And what it essentially indicates is that uh, what Muhammad Ali Jinnah saw in his dream, that coming into reality, the formation of Pakistan, a land for Muslims, uh, that was a true event that occurred uh, and uh, it further strengthens this hadith about uh, seeing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in, uh, in a dream, in a person's dream. Um, so we've got some things that we can consider now and before we close off from this historical overview, uh, it is important that we take note of a few important points uh, that we have discussed. Um, and these important points, and uh, I've also found some uh, some very interesting facts about Pakistan. Uh, we will go through them. Um, Pakistan actually was founded on the day of the 27th of Ramadan. Uh, a lot of people believe that the 27th of Ramadan, the night of the 27th of Ramadan, is Laylatul Qadr. Um, the name Pakistan in uh, in Persian. Uh, or in Urdu, it's a mix. It has a similar meaning to that of Medina, uh, which is a, a place for uh, uh, people that are pure or pure people uh, that live in a pure place. Then, based on what we have uh, already reviewed in, in terms of the hadiths, uh, there will be a time that Khilafat will rise again, uh, and this will be after the period of the tyranny that will come uh, during this time an army will rise from the direction of east um, most likely from the direction of Khurasan um, and the Mahdi will be amongst them it is important to understand that the direction of east and the direction of Khurasan uh, should be understood as uh, the way that it is it's not actually Khurasan uh, and there's a lot of documentary, uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion on this uh, as well in terms of hadiths, but we can't find anything conclusive that says within Khurasan, um, when you actually analyze the Arabic context of the hadiths, it's from the direction of Khurasan that is important. Uh, this uh, army will be signified or uh, one of the signatures that it will have uh, is it will have black flags. Uh, this is based on the hadiths. Then we understand that the formation of Pakistan was a destiny for the Muslims, according to uh, Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah's dream, uh, that Pakistan will have a critical role to play in the future of Islam. This is based on, based on Islamic uh, eschatology, and Pakistan will lead the whole Muslim world. This is what the Sufi uh, spirituality. Uh, traditions say about Pakistan. So having understood uh, some of these references that we have made, now we come to Muhammad Qasim's dream. Uh, and Muhammad Qasim's dreams uh, have a very important and strategic uh, place in, in the understanding of the global events. And um, actually this is my belief that the dreams fit into the historical hadith concept um, and uh, the story that is a bit vivid in the hadiths, uh, Muhammad Qasim's dreams actually are indicative of what might happen or what events might happen. Uh, and I'm led to believe that these 
uh, dreams are true in the form of what events will happen because of the fact that what has happened with Imran Khan um, has come true exactly as what Muhammad Qasim saw. Uh, and as I've discussed with you guys previously, Muhammad Qasim's dreams, uh, they uh, he has actually seen events that will happen in his dreams. Uh, and he goes through that from, from an observer's point of view. He goes through those dreams. Um, and uh, the events that are shown to him, they connect with the hadiths, but they give us a bit more detail about what uh, will happen. Uh, but well, one of Muhammad Qasim's very important dreams about uh, why Pakistan was made. Um, this dream is from 2006, uh, where Muhammad Qasim says that uh, he thought or he, he says in the dream that there's every vice, oppression and injustice in Pakistan. So why did Allah make Pakistan? And the answer that he got was that 1400 years ago, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to supplicate to Allah uh, that, O oh Allah, near Qayyama, create such a country whose name will be La ilaha illallah. And when Islam or Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Islam would become weak in the entire world, then let it rise from this country into the entire world. Um, and hence, Pakistan was made by Allah. Now, very important dream because this ties into the hadith about the fourth and the fifth stage where we discussed the tyranny and we discussed the um, coming back of the Khilafah. Uh, this dream is indicating where uh, that would come from. And uh, we have looked at the Islamic eschatology and Sufi traditions, uh, which are also indicating or confirming uh, that Pakistan is the place where um, Islam might rise again from. Uh, and uh, this is a very profound dream of Muhammad Qasim, uh, uh, which uh, basically establishes the rationale for the existence of Pakistan. Um, then we have a dream of Muhammad Qasim from 2019. Now, Pakistan has gone through a very difficult past. Um, there have been times uh, from the formation of Pakistan in 1947 to now uh, where Pakistan could have really lifted up. Uh, it's in a very strategic location, uh, very central location to uh, access to both the east and the west. Uh, it's... Uh, nature of where uh, Pakistan has. Pakistan has played very important roles in the past um, to the uh, military uh, roles. For example, when we look at the uh, war between uh, the USA and Russia, uh, Pakistan played a fundamental role. And within the Muslim world, even today, the Pakistan army plays a very fundamental role. Uh, but Pakistan itself has not succeeded. It, it has not become independent as uh, many of the countries of the world uh, would say are. It's still in that developing country uh, status. And um, what Muhammad Qasim has seen about this is that uh, many rulers uh, have come into Pakistan, uh, but Pakistan did not succeed. Uh, in 2019, he also saw that Imran Khan will also pale, fail and uh, people will have big hopes with him and they will be disappointed after uh, seeing that Imran Khan has also failed. Um, then uh, Muhammad Qasim says that in that dream, he says that the reason uh, that uh, Pakistan has uh, faced failure and disorder and never succeeded is because we have not been able to abolish shirk or eliminate shirk from the country. Um, and this is the reason why Allah's help has never arrived for Pakistan. Um, while we are here, the uh, dreams of uh, Muhammad Qasim from 2017 up until now, that he's seen various dreams about Imran Khan, his leadership situation of Pakistan, important events that will occur uh, or that will happen, they have all come true exactly as what Muhammad Qasim uh, saw them. Um, then we have a future for uh, Pakistan, Muhammad Qasim's stream. Uh, Muhammad Qasim has seen that Pakistan will rise and become a uh, superpower or a global superpower. 
uh, it will do so by defeating the uh, global powers that exist at, at the time, uh, namely uh, USA, Russia, uh, and uh, Israel, and European countries. Um, and this time will come uh, after Pakistan goes through uh, a system of changes. Uh, this system of changes uh, begins with the implementation of Islamic presidential system or presidential system that is based on Islamic values. Now, this system will come into Pakistan after Imran Khan um, and Muhammad Qasim has seen that once Imran Khan fails, there will be certain events that will happen within the country that will increase the level of chaos uh, and it will uh, also cause a negative impact on the economy, uh, on the financial position of the country uh, and it will lead to a situation where the presidential system will be implemented uh, either by force where the army comes in and makes that decision uh, or by an external uh, force. Uh, we're not really clear about that but we, we are expecting that the presidential system will come in and it will eliminate all forms of shirk um, from Pakistan and that's when Allah's help and Rahmah will come to the people of Pakistan and Pakistan will start developing. Pakistan will progress uh, by leaps and bounds in a short amount of time so Pakistan will achieve a lot um, within a short amount of time and Muhammad Qasim has said that um, the uh, western world or the outside world people outside Pakistan uh, will be amazed at uh, what they will come to know uh, about Pakistan and what Pakistan has achieved uh, and peace and tranquility will prevail speedily in Pakistan um, meaning that there will be uh, a time of uh, peaceful uh, operations people will have what they need there will be no more oppression uh, there will be no more uh, difficulties within the country uh, that Pakistan will face. Um, now, within the context of what we have discussed previously uh, in uh, in this lecture about the black flags and the uh, area from the east, uh, Muhammad Qasim has seen that Pakistan uh, will develop and will gain certain important uh, features or you can say technologies. And now some of these technologies will be uh, things that will, for example, uh, remove the power shortage issue. For example, ele electricity is a big issue in Pakistan. So there will be some sort of a technology that will be developed or discovered um, that will uh, fix the issue of uh, electrical uh, supply in Pakistan. Um, then Muhammad Qasim has also seen that there will be uh, Allah will grant Pakistan with 3,000 black jet fighters and Muhammad Qasim has seen that these black jet fighters play a central role in the uh, wars uh, that will be uh, imposed upon Pakistan. Uh, for example, the war that happens uh, from uh, Ghazwa Hind perspective and then the liberation uh, that Pakistan will lead the Muslim world. Muhammad Qasim has seen that uh, Pakistan will uh, liberate all the Muslim countries up until uh, the west, western side um, and that it does by the help of those 3,000 black jet fighters. Now these black jet, jet fighters could possibly be the black flags um, that have been talked about in the hadiths uh, because once again hadiths were 1400 years ago so the concept of seeing black flags in today's world or today's modern uh, warfare, uh, we don't see uh, armies using flags as uh, as they had used uh, many, many years ago. Um, and what Muhammad Qasim has also seen is that Pakistan has a very important uh, role within the Muslim world. Uh, Pakistan is one of the castles uh, and there are two other castles, namely Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Um, when the Malhamatul Kubra begins, which is the World War III, uh, this will lead 
to the destruction of the Middle Eastern countries. Um, and the battleground for this, by the way, is in the Middle East. Um, and eventually Turkey falls and Saudi Arabia falls. And then Pakistan is the only country or the last minara of uh, Islam left in the Muslim world. And then Islam rises again from uh, Pakistan. So some of these things that uh, we have discussed today, um, important, uh, I guess, hold importance from our understanding about where Pakistan is and what the future of Pakistan is going to be in, in the coming years. Um, remember the uh, notion about the 3000 black jet fighters that I've discussed, uh, which holds very close significance with the black flags um, and also the liberation of the Muslim world that Muhammad Qasim has seen in his dreams that Pakistan will liberate the Muslim world from uh, the west uh, to the from the east to the west uh, sorry and uh, that liberation is also discussed in the hadiths uh, where the army from Khurasan will uh, rest until it goes into Jerusalem and establishes uh, Islam there. Uh, very, once again, significant and important uh, dreams of Muhammad Qasim uh, about Pakistan. Now, as far as uh, the current geopolitical situation of Pakistan is concerned, there were some questions raised in the previous discussion. Uh, some people wanted to ask about uh, what will happen to Imran Khan. Will he get elected again? Uh, what is happening with Shabazz Sharif? Uh, you know, he, uh, Mohammed Qasim said that Imran Khan is the last political option, but Shabazz Sharif is now the Prime Minister of Pakistan. So I would like to um, take uh, some minutes to clarify these things. Um, basically, Imran Khan being the last political option uh, meant that Imran Khan was the last person who will be elected by the people of Pakistan. Uh, now, where we see the coming of Shabazz Sharif, uh, his presence in the government is not elected by the people. He has come by force uh, by uh, going through the rules of a constitution. Uh, so we we shouldn't confuse the two together. Um, as far as re-elections are concerned, Muhammad Qasim uh, saw a recent dream which has been uh, made public. That dream is from the 15th of April 2022. You can check it on this channel. Um, and that dream indicates that Imran Khan gets ousted and uh, then he tries very hard to get uh, early elections, uh, but he is unsuccessful in achieving them or early elections do not happen. Um, whether they do end up happening in the future, uh, we're not really sure about that at this stage. But even if they do happen, what we know is that the Islamic presidential system will come into play in Pakistan. And there will be certain series of events that will happen before that, that will create perhaps such a situation that the president's presidential system will be implemented. And some of those things I've discussed previously, but the important things uh, that we can repeat are that there will be a tragedy, tragedy or a death of an important politician in Pakistan that will create this chaos. Um, and there's also a dream of Muhammad Qasim about the uh, attack that will happen on Lahore. Um, there will be a large part of Lahore that will get captured by the um, anti-Pakistan forces um, and uh, this will create a chaos within the country. Uh, but what we come to know is that from Muhammad Qasim's dreams, um, as they're becoming popular in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia uh, and the eastern countries, there are a lot of Muslim scholars and ulamas that are recognizing these dreams. Um, and that has been already shown to Muhammad Qasim that his dreams are getting popular there. Um, there have been some questions about whether Muhammad Qasim has seen uh, the uh, seen any dreams about Imran Khan's future. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't know of anything that um, we can discuss, unfortunately. Uh, but we know that uh, there is 
going to be a situation where the army chief of Pakistan will recognize Muhammad Qasim streams and uh, after recognizing Muhammad Qasim streams army chief of Pakistan uh, will set some um, strategies in place that will uh, basically allow for Pakistan to plan according to uh, the Muhammad Qasim streams and also implement Islam correctly in Pakistan. Now I'm just going to have a quick look at some of the questions if we can answer them for you today. Um, we've got uh, a question from uh, gentleman Mohammed Qasim. Will he be present in today's live discussion? Unfortunately not, uh, but we are uh, discussing and working on it. The more uh, popular we can get these sessions to get, um, the easier it will be inshallah to get Mohammed Qasim on board uh, and have a discussion. He is a very shy uh, person. He's um, a very personal and reserved personality. Um, he uh, doesn't always feel comfortable to come online uh, but inshallah uh, within these sessions in the future we will find a time and a day to have discussion with Mohammed Qasim uh all right let's have a look wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone who has uh said salam uh good to see you my brother from bangladesh uh has army chief listened to qasim bhai or not please uh wa alaikum assalam uh Dear server, uh, no, we don't know and we don't think so. Um, we don't think that the army chief has listened to Muhammad Qasim or not, uh, but perhaps there are some people who will watch this video and they can communicate the um, dreams of Muhammad Qasim to him. It's all just a matter of getting the information through to him, inshallah, one day. Uh, Walaikum Salam from Indonesia. Very good to see you from Indonesia and Malaysia. Kazi uh, Nafis. I'm sorry, brother. I uh, cannot talk in Urdu because we had a lot of people who wanted to talk in English. I can't speak two languages at the same time. I'm really sorry, but we will have subtitles that you can come and watch. Uh, this video later and read the subtitles. I'm sorry about that. Um, we have uh, uh, our brother from India or a sister from India. Welcome, good to see you. Um, mashallah. All right, any other question? Uh, wa alaikum aslam, wa alaikum aslam. All right, so not any questions that I can see. Oh, there's uh, a question about Khurasan, which nation? Um, Khurasan, uh, I believe that it was the ancient Persia uh, that we are discussing here, but it was a territory like uh, that existed during the times of Roman. And the territory was forever changing depending on the uh, surrounding parties or surrounding uh, areas. Uh, so Khurasan actually uh, at that time included uh, Afghanistan, which was the main country, uh, and the surrounding areas of Afghanistan, which includes Iran, Pakistan, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan at the top. Uh, once again, the exact boundaries were not fully clear off because uh, this was a long time ago where maps did not exist. Um, but there have been some commentary and some discussions about where the rough boundaries are, and I've discussed that in this video. Can you please explain the birthplace of the Mahdi according to Hadith? Now, birthplace of Mahdi, uh, according to Hadith, the Sahi Hadith that uh, we have read and understood, uh, the birthplace of Mahdi is not discussed. Uh, the only discussion that we can make a pinpoint conclusion to 
about Mahdi is that he is going to be in Makkah uh, and Medina at the time that the Bayya happens. And uh, that is when he will be formally recognized as the Mahdi. Before that, he is not going to be the Mahdi. Um, whoever, uh, I guess, comes to that point of realization needs to understand that the Mahdi doesn't necessarily have to be from the Arabic background. Uh, during, uh, well, since the uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam have left this world, now, if we just do quick mathematics, for example, every generation that came uh, after him uh, in the family of Fatma radiallahu anhu, um, even if there were two uh, two males that could carry the uh, genealogy forward, um, we would have over twenty five million people uh, after you know fifteen hundred years. So uh, twenty five million people means that anyone could be anywhere. Uh, and it's very difficult for us to understand um, or pinpoint to the fact that where that particular person from the family of Prophet Muhammad would be. We can't say that they would be uh, in Saudi Arab or Oman or Egypt. Um, they could potentially be anywhere in the world. But what we do know for certain is that at the time of Bayah, the person will be in Medina and Makkah. And there is a famous hadith uh, of that, that there will be a um, fight or uh, a quarrel between three sons of a Khalifa. And uh, during that quarrel or that time of uh, difficulty, uh, the Mahdi will move from Medina to Mecca. And that's when he will be uh, called upon or recognized as the Mahdi. So we don't know, according to hadith, what the birthplace of the Mahdi is. And uh, I think uh, uh, it would be uh, it wouldn't be wise to make conclusions on that uh, unless we have a thorough knowledge and understanding on it. Uh, welcome, my brother from Bangladesh. Welcome uh, from Indonesia. Welcome from Malaysia. Welcome from uh, India. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, I hope that uh, you are all able to understand or get a better understanding of Muhammad Qasim's dreams uh, about Pakistan. Uh, please have a look at this channel um, where there are dreams uploaded about Pakistan. Uh, also go to muhammadqasimpk.com and have a read about the dreams related to Pakistan. Um, the reason we are doing these live discussions is to create a context for our viewers so they can easily understand the importance of dreams from a perspective of what's happening globally uh, or what has happened in the past or what is happening in the present. Um, and we hope, inshallah, that Allah helps us uh, deliver this message such that people are able to understand Muhammad Qasim's streams a little bit better, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair for uh, being here with us and uh, listening to this uh, live telecast. Inshallah, next week we have another important uh, topic and we will be discussing, uh, or uh, I have an important message for the Muslim scholars uh, and ulamas. So, uh, inshallah, next uh, Sunday's topic, we will go through that one. Uh, until then, uh, stay safe and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you all safe and your family safe and happy and blessed, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.